This video is sponsored by Alpha Draft, where you can play fantasy esports and win money. And you can play Counter Strike Global Offensive, is one of them. They've got League of Legends, Dota, Smite, all those good things. So if you want to do so, go to the link in the description box below and you can give me some referral money. Now, when fans critique pro players, it's a phenomenon that's pretty much existed throughout Counter-Strike, going way back to even before 1.6, the earliest versions, because there used to be websites similar to how HLTV.org is now. I guess in CS, we, we've got the benefit of still having many websites that people go on, especially with linear col linear comment sections, where you see comments, and as a result, people always after games and during games are going to critique players and say, oh, I didn't like the way this guy played, or what this guy did, or what this guy made such a stupid move, or what a brilliant move this was. Oftentimes, critique actually is critical in the sense of being kind of harsh on the players, like this player was shit, or this guy did this totally wrong, or what a stupid move even, you know. It's, it's usually not necessarily the most curtailed in terms of the way it's described. But especially because of the era of Reddit, I think this has brought about a whole new level to this kind of phenomenon of fan critique. Because when a fan was critiquing on a website, yes, certain ideas such as, well, if and sucks or Maniac is a bot, yes, these ideas will proliferate, these memes will get out there among the culture once people have seen them enough. But on Reddit, because comments are upvoted, all someone has to do is phrase something in, in the, the kind of vernacular and the right wording and the right phrasing of how other fans think. And they don't even have to think that themselves or go into too much detail. They just hop on board and they upvote it and it goes up there. And then that very quickly can become seen as like, oh, this is our consensus. This is popular. I'm going to buy into this. I think that's the case. And the problem with a lot of the critical critiquing of players in this sense is that I feel like it's got some key flaws which people are ignoring that actually make it to some degrees, it can lack a lot of value when I break it down this way. So first and foremost, it tends to be very simplistic in terms of its reasoning. Now, one, as one aspect of very simplistic reasoning that I really dislike is when people will take what the pro player did and just directly compare it to what has either happened or usually would happen in their own games of, of Counter-Strike Global Offensive. So, for example, in matchmaking games at silver level or gold nova level, and these people are comparing situations of like positioning, the comms over the mic, uh, teamwork, aiming, actual consistency of being able to hit difficult shots they're comparing all these things to what their experience is like actually playing at that level and yet if you think about how different the two levels are how different all the circumstances can be for every single one of those categories i just gave you and the qualities that it takes to be a good player this becomes overly simplistic that they're just comparing in that way like someone will say something like oh you know it at at my gold Nova level, they do that. I mean, I'll go through the points one by one, shall I? So, so one of the first ones that fans love to go on and on about, and actually, you know what? I'm going to throw casters in there as well. I've heard many casters do this, is they go on and on. At once, what they'll do is they are very results orientated. They don't say these things beforehand, but once someone plays a situation and loses it, they take whatever he did that, that led to him losing, then they, then they compare it in this manner and they label it negatively. So say someone is in a 1v1 or even a 2v1, as in he's with his teammate versus one person. If he peaks, so you might just not even call this peaking, over peaking. If he peaks aggressively or he peaks repeatedly, if he dies and the one player wins the round, either in 1v1 or kills him and then kills his teammate and wins the round, people will make this black and white. Like, right, him peaking is the reason he lost this fight here. As though in every situation you shouldn't peak. Like if he had just stayed, then the enemy has to come to him and waste time. These principles, here's the thing, at an advanced level are correct. Like as a general rule of thumb, you want to try and use position over the enemy and keep position concealed and to waste time and to draw him to where you are and choose the terms of the battleground. As general principles, these all apply. But what they ignore is the fact that there are circumstances, which a lot of these people aren't seeing because in their games, it wouldn't be the case, where very skilled players actually would have been better off peaking in certain situations to just kill the enemy dead before he has a chance to root out all the areas. What if he has a Molotov left? What if he has a flash left? Instead, when he comes into a site, like, for example, the uh, A site on Cash, when he comes into this particular site, he's not sure where you are. So sometimes if you peek out early, you're getting a free shot onto him. Whereas if you let him by process of elimination go everywhere against in a 1v1 especially, then sometimes there's going to be a situation where he'll get to you and now he knows you have to be there and he has a much better chance of killing you actually, even if it wastes some of his time. It's not always as black and white as it might seem so. Just because in my gold Nova game, I wouldn't even peek that. That's actually irrelevant in this particular case. You have to judge it on a very 
advanced level using all the factors with all the context, not just in such a black and white, oh, peaking's always bad if you lose the situation, because that's not always the case. In fact, in some 2v1s, having one person peak is actually going to be favorable because he might just be able to kill the guy outright. And also, even if he doesn't get the kill, as long as he doesn't get killed, he's now making the enemy focus on him, which means the other guy can peek out and kill him, or he's, he's drawing the enemy to a specific location. There's a lot of things can be done here that aren't just as simple as peaking equals bad, therefore for player peaks, he is bad. And since I wouldn't, if since even I know that, that's irrelevant. That's another thing. Just because you know something doesn't mean you do it all the time in your games. So I'm sure you're in situations in 1v1s where you do the wrong move. You fluff it. You think, oh, this sort of player, I can push him. Or this sort of player, I'll hold back. And you hold the angle too tight. And maybe you're not so good up close. And he just kills you instantly. And you're like, oh, fuck. Should have peeked him around. Or I should have taken a different angle. Or I panicked. That happens to pro players too. You have to remember, the key thing to remember about pro players is, yes, they're better in almost every category than you. But in general, as people, pro players are just like you. They just, or Some of them just happen to have better aim. That's it. Some of them also have better game knowledge than us, but a number of them just happen to have better aim. Either just better hand-eye coordination, or they just took to the game of CS better, and they've just advanced much quicker than you have and have gotten a high level. They're not superhuman computers who, just because they have super aim, doesn't mean their brain level means that they always make the right decision, and they're that intelligent in this sense. In-game IQ is very different from sitting outside of the game, or after the fact, being able to replay in your mind what happened and decide what the better option would be. It's not, it's not always the case that you can pick the best option in that situation. And like I say, because they have a different skill set, if someone has phenomenal skills, actually sometimes peaking for him is the better approach. Like there are certain people where their skill set might be really fast reaction flick shots. And if they take a 1v1 aim duel like that, they're going to win it 70% of the time. Now the same player might not be good at static holding a corner angle, waiting for someone to come into the crosshair, close range shots. So actually this player will be at a disadvantage if he waits for the other guy to come to him in a 1v1. So you can't judge it as simply as that. Now in terms of playing a CT, much like the overpeaking thing in 1v1s, another thing that's always people complain about is if the CTs set up into normal, normal positions defensively, and then one player aggressively pushes into an area, people just complain and say, and if he dies without killing anyone, right, where well, he lost the round for them, and if he hadn't have done that, they could have won this round and they would have an extra man. That's not, that, again, it's not as black and white as that. Like, for example, you can't always play default. If you've seen teams who play to, try to play super default, so there was a period in time where, at times, team like Nip, teams like Nip have played to, tried to play very default, way past in the back, uh, way back in the past. Teams like Dignitas used to play very default. Now, with their high skill level, they could still be good CT teams, but there's a reason why in the late 2014, it was Envy, it was Fnatic who were the super good teams, because they would... And in terms of Envy, they would press aggressively because they had super good skilled players. And in terms of Fnatic, they would push up as a unit to get specific information. That's the thing. By pushing up in these situations, yes, they were risking making it a 4v5 for their team. But they also were gambling on getting information, which if you're a team like Fnatic, can actually be more important than even having one guy alive. Just knowing that, oh, they're actually going to A now, there's nothing in here. Even if I got killed, they got killed by one guy holding the banana, and actually they were fast pushing into A, and now I can have my rotator go there really quickly. That can be worth it. Getting information gives you the chance to play make, which if you push up, like for example, think on Overpass, when they're playing in the long area as CT Fnatic. They'll push up there with like Crimson Olaf or Crimson JW and one will draw the fire from the other, pushing up aggressively, but to allow the other to take the shot when the enemies come onto him or they'll push up and both hold aggressive angles. So you can't just be taken out 1v1. So in these scenarios, yeah, aggressive pushing again at your skill Silver Nova level, or silver, or silver or gold nova level, it might be the case that you should be learning the fundamentals and you shouldn't just be trying bullshit pushes randy like this because they're not going to work for you that often. And when they do, they're not going to help you learn the fundamentals of the game. These players, the top level ones, a lot of them know the fundamentals and sometimes they're making the moves the correctly. Like for example, in that overpass game against Cloud9 that Fnatic had where they narrowly won. A big reason why they won is even though Olaf didn't have a good map, he constantly play made and found circumstances where he could get in behind opponents and he could just get the information sometimes that they're not coming to his site. And as a result, the people playing the B site were able to be more prepared and were able to know, right, lock it down because they're all coming here now. He was able to push up and get a kill and therefore freeze the game and make the terrorists have to reset what they're doing and regroup and go to a different area to not make it telegraphed. Playmaking in these scenarios, some, it's not always the case that aggressively pushing up like this is wrong. And you don't always have to be the best player to do it. But again, if you are the best the best players, also sometimes your skill can allow you to do it. If Envy players push up like that into the banana, sometimes they're just going to wreck the whole game. Then when they play off defensively, they're going to lure the enemy into being more cautious of when he's coming up there and give them more time to get those flashes, the mollies, the smokes down on B Inferno to hold them off even longer. 
so they can hold it with the two men. Now, missing shots. Here's another one. People always talk about, oh, that guy missed an easy shot there. First of all, when you talk about easy shots, you have to understand that the same shot for you is not the same shot for an opponent, for the pro player, even if it looks the same. Because the way that other pro players move and know how to dodge is very different. They're much better at it, especially the ones who know each other and know how to juke each other. Beyond just that, you have players who, when you're taking the shot against them and you're a top pro level player, sometimes you're gonna have to fire really quickly. And if you're not in position to do a really nice refined technique, the circumstances might dictate you have to just spray wildly or shoot really quickly at him. Because if you're playing and that guy's all off M, you know if you miss your first burst, he probably kills you then. He probably just kills you outright. In fact, he might just kill you while you're having the aim duel with an instant one bullet headshot. It's different when you're playing at the low level. You can sometimes fuck around and take more bursts and dodge a bit and then take tap a few into his body because he might not kill you immediately. It's not the same circumstances. Therefore, sometimes the pro will have to take what looks like a worse shot, a less refined shot, a more risky shot. Because in this particular circumstance, when you know the context, context, actually that's his better chance to win by doing so. There's also the factor that aim is not linear. I feel like this is a concept that people don't understand, and yet if they think about their own games logically, they should understand this principle. Aim is not linear and it's not consistent at any level in general. As in, there are players who hit the 10 out of 10 shot level, degree of difficulty shots at the pro level with an astonishing ability. You can't understand how they do it. So like JW is a great example of it, Skadoodle is a great example of it, Guardian is a great example of it. But these same players will sometimes miss what actually might look, in terms of their skill set, like a 6 or a 7 out of 10 shot because of the range or the circumstances of how they're being attacked or they're worried that they're going to have to fire it really quickly because they think they're going to be swarmed by someone from the, from the side. They have to get this shot off as quick as they can and hope they get a kill and move to that guy or just shoot because they're going to be swarmed in any way and killed. The, in this scenario, it's not the case. People, The reason why I say it's not linear is because people think to themselves, right, well, if he hits the 10 out of 10 shot, then he should always hit the 7 out of 10 shot. No, not always. And in fact, there's some players in CS, I think of someone like Crims, who seems like he always does hit the 6 and 7 out of 10 shot. He hits them like 90% of the time. But then he doesn't make that many crazy 10 out of 10 shots. And yet he's as competitive with some of the players who hit the 10 out of 10 shots. So you have to understand this aspect. It's not the case also in terms of linear that because you hit the 10 out of 10 shot, then you should hit this one. Same as in your game. I'm sure you hit a crazy shot every now and then, but also miss some bad shots. And you know what? Sometimes you're really consistent with the other ones and then you can't make the one difficult one you need to and you're like, fuck, if only I was a better player. It's not linear at any level. And so the idea that you can, again, look at this player and go, huh, I'd have hit that, uh, that easy AWP shot at my Gold Nova level. Nah, we don't know if you would. We don't know if you would against that opponent. And even if you would, that's no, that's actually no real statement. That's not any kind of, st any kind of indictment of this guy's skill level because he might hit a 10 out of 10 shot in a minute that you can't even conceive of and would never even be able to go for because you'd get wrecked if you did and lose your AWP every time. In terms of force buying, now you have to understand here, in general, I think a lot of the critique about force buying is, is correct. As in a lot of the time, I think pro teams actually do abuse this. I think this is an area where pro teams don't always know best and that sometimes the moment captures them where they want to greedily get this round back now instead of being willing to save and wait for another round or play for an overtime where sometimes they fuck themselves. But you have to understand, first of all, this is a principle that goes back to 1.6. Even in 1.6 where force buying was punished even harder... It was the case, actually, that certain teams who were phenomenal, Na'Vi was one, but the most famous were the Poles, Neo, Taz, those guys. They were gods at getting one AK or one AK a Galil and just eagles or pistols and being able to turn that into an entire round win. But they had a plan for it. Like the guy with the AK is going to go first and then the Deagle guy is going to run out, draw the attention from him. He's going to try and kill that guy. There's a gun he's got for his teammate. Plus, if it's Neo holding the one AK, that's very different when it's Neo has the one rifle from if you're playing in a Gold Nova game and one player has the rifle who's a similar level Level to all of the opponents who have five rifles and flashes and nades and smokes and all armor and they have the jump on you that's a very different scenario which you shouldn't do the force by them also if you're envious envious are the best team ever at force buys they can make force buys work all the time they can make a full deagle force buy work after they lose the pistol round and they don't still make it work a lot of the time but they might they can make it work is way above and beyond the level of any of you or i if we're playing in in matchmaking so again, it's not as simple as just criticizing that. I mean, if you look at that round that Envious did the Force Deagle by, where they had like four Deagles, uh, it was the second CT round on overpass against Dignitas in the 
second map of the semi-finals and that was a huge round and it, when you look at it it's like around that only they could win but even the way they played it was was good they found close to medium range shots and then they they all fired like slowly in general to just do body shots to it so that between all their sick aimers and especially because Dignitas had funneled through the monster tunnel they were able to get these kills and make it work comms this is one that drives me crazy because when those comms came out the pov vod for cloud nine from the major from esl1 Kadavice, obviously yes the comms sounded bad compared to a lot of pro level team i won't deny that and i won't stand up for them but unfortunately people took this thing where they were like huh, in my in my ranked five i guess you don't have ranked fives in league in my just mixed team that we play matchmaking with we have better comms than that right first and foremost some of the reason why they had bad comms and people kept saying, what is the strat here? What am I supposed to do? Is because they were doing complicated strats. Like they were doing specific f smokes into a certain area that then going to be followed up with a Molotov into another area and then two flashes here. And then someone had to be in this spot and they needed to know that some of that was just checking what was going to happen next so they could play off this guy correctly. It's not the same as in your, your matchmaking game. In terms of them talking too much, okay, that's one I won't defend actually. They do talk too much sometimes. But you also have to understand, think about when we heard the, saw the, subtitled version of the Fnatic VOD where they won the final on Inferno over Nip. Now they're the best team in the world, maybe the best team ever, yet you listen to their comms and I'm sure their comms sound like they're worse, not as good, not as informative as some of your matchmaking games. But one of the reasons why that you have to understand the context of is when you play the matchmaking game, in general you don't know any of the people you're playing with. You have zero basis for any team player communication. Therefore you have to give more information, you have to give information that otherwise might be obvious, you have to really articulate what you're going to do and what you want the other person to do. You have to give what sounds like good communication but is really there to artificially put in place a basis of team play now people like Fnatic don't need that they've known each other a long time they've developed a shorthand of what they're going to do they've practiced tactics and they have a basic bank build up where when someone says something very simple they know what that translates in their minds that translates to four or five different sentences and I'm going to do this and this specifically but they don't need to be told every detail of it that's another reason why in a weird way I think that actually Cloud9 at this last May, this last tournament got too much credit because at times Sean Gares would make a call where he he'd have to explain some smaller details of it and almost mini micro a couple of players where actually that makes him sound awesome and he was but unfortunately that actually shows that his teammates aren't at a communication strategic level of some of the top level teams like a Fnatic for example where they don't need to do that because it's already built in in their system and their system works and people know their jobs and know what they're adapting to in this case and know intuitively how to play off each other without always having to use comms and so there's a lot of free space for the comms in a Fnatic comms for example. To give you an example, okay, of the basic theory I'm trying to expound here about the differences between what your level is and the pro level, is I'll give you a comparison to poker. Because when you play poker at the low levels, in general, you should be using basic strategy. You should be playing, there's literally, you can get like key cards of like, these are the sort of hands you play in this early position. And these are the hands you play in a late position. These are the kind of bets you're gonna make when you play them. If the opponent does this, here's a flow chart of what you're likely gonna do. And then you add in a little bit of reading the game, but in general, you're gonna play numbers. You're gonna play stats. You're hopefully gonna have a heads up display that's gonna tell you the stats on when he falls and stuff. You're just gonna try and play the numbers and play a smart conservative game with a little bit of edge in it. So you're not playing too conservative. If you don't get any cards, you can't win. You're gonna play a little bit of reading and you're gonna try and win playing the right way. Now, the best players online in poker don't play the right way. They play a way where if you played this way at $1, $2, you would, no limit, you'd lose all your money, you'd have no money within even a day. You wouldn't, you wouldn't get through a day, I'm telling you. Because the meta game at the top level of high roller poker, where these are the best players in the world playing each other, first of all, They've played millions of hands. So their understanding of all the different situations is so insane that they can have very specific understanding of what to do in a situation which an amateur shouldn't even venture into. Therefore, he should never even try it. They can also execute it because they have that basis and they've played so many different situations more than the amateur does that they can make it work. And the meta game itself can be totally radically different at different times. So when po poker first got really big in like the mid 2000s online, the really, really insane people who are winning like hundreds of thousands in a day and wrecking all these whales and beating each other for these crazy pots of 200k and no limit. They used to play hyper-aggressive, which again would be a terrible, it would be literally the worst way for a beginning or medium tier player to play at his level. Unless he had godlike reading ability, which is very unlikely he's going to have. And it's very unlikely he'll develop to any degree because he's not at the pro level where they played the millions of hands. 
So they had a hyper-aggressive thing at the time where they would push each other all in in mad situations where they didn't have the cards and they were just making reads that, like, some of them were insane. Some of them can make a read that, like, he had a pair of tens, but just from knowing the way the cards had gone before and the way the opponent had played, he knew that his opponent, from the way his opponent was playing, likely had a pair of, uh, well, like he had, like, ace, ace, or oh, ace ten. And so he could get his opponent off off the ace ten and not even get to a flop. Or he might sometimes be able to do it when his opponent had the queens. But he would play in a way that was so hyper aggressive and re raises that make the opponent think he must have the aces here, and so he'd fold. The meta game was totally different there. And here's the key thing that I'm making the point of: much like with the aiming scenario, the reaction of the other player to the, what you could do the same exact move as the hyper aggressive player did, the high roller, but the reaction of the other player will be different. And so. You, likewise, in the more modern day, it went from being the hyper-aggressive to this crazy min-raise era where they were trying to get as many min-raises as they could in to get max value out of these people, then get them into a flop, and then they were going to read them. And it was such a crazy meta game that you wouldn't even understand. You'd be totally lost. You'd be, you'd be out at sea if you were a low-level player. Now, what's key about this example is it can only be truly understood once you know the context of the high level, and it disobeys many of the rules of normal play. So I'll now apply this back to CS, and I'll give you an example, okay, which is when you play the nuke, Normal positions for nuke, especially 1.6 nuke, where you played off on the ramp, you played back at the corner, going up to the ladder area, or you played really close up at the wall at like a full 180 angle. So the guy would have to come out and turn a full 90 degrees or even maybe 180 if he was coming out looking towards the ramp to shoot you. Those were the three main angles you played. People actually didn't that often play off the other box unless they had an extra man there. These were the general correct positions to play. But as a result, if you were an elite level pro who was very good at nuke and you were playing another very good nuke team, especially a good nuke T side team, sometimes it might be correct for you to come in, be over towards on that long wall, be not in the very corner, but further out, almost out in the middle. So you have no cover because when the other guy comes out, he's going to look here first at the guy on the ramp, or he's going to do a 180 and try and spin back to look at the guy in the corner, or he's going to look in front, but then not onto you. He's going to be looking at the wrong, he's going to pre-fire or look at the wrong three angles, but you will be locked right on him because you can put your crosshair right to the edge of where he's going to come out. So if you're a better player, that's the wrong position. That's a terrible low level position to be in. A noob would do that at a low level, but you're doing it because they're never going to predict you're going to be there. You have an element of surprise and you're doing it for a specific purpose, which you're going to then execute and you can then get a few kills doing that. But if a low level player watched that and saw a succeed, they might be like, well, that's the way I should play. You shouldn't. And if they saw you die from that, they'd be like, what an idiot. He didn't have cover. He peeked out. He didn't make the enemy come to him. That was just terrible understanding of where enemies are going to attack from. And he'd be wrong. So again, the main point I'm making here is not that the critiques are all wrong, not that there's no basis for them, not that the principles behind them are always incorrect. It's that people go way too far and are way too quick to make these critiques and they're doing it in a way where their reasoning isn't very good. Like they might be right in terms of the of the play was wrong, but if you can't explain why it's wrong, then do you really know it's wrong? How do we actually know it's wrong? You have to be able to give your reasoning, show you're working out, argue the merits of the case. Don't just say it is wrong. I know what I know that, and at my low level, because in, in the, a lot of these cases, it's not black and white. There's detailed, complex context to understand here, and the meta game must be understood to be radically different for top level pros from people who just play matchmaking. Even if you're playing even close to the global elite level, that's still nothing like the top level of international competition in Counter Strike.